political consensus might come together. God, I hope so. It's been such a divided last 10 years or so in this country and around the world, but maybe things are changing. Shall we talk to the political correspondent of the Sunday Times? I think it's time, don't you? It's John Boothman. A very warm welcome to Early Breakfast here on Talk TV. John? Good morning. How are you? Yeah, I'm all right, thanks. I think it's nice that we ask each other how we are at this time. How are you? Yeah, splendid. Um, I've been out this morning in the centre of Edinburgh. It's very dark, but preparations underway for the next few days as things move away, certainly in Scotland, from, you know, the Highland estate, and side at Balmoral. Now, if you go into the centre of Edinburgh, the roads are closed, diversions are up, barriers are being erected. There's a lot of security as really people prepare for that transition from Balmoral tomorrow down into the capital city of Edinburgh when the Queen will finally make that long, slow journey to London, really, stopping off in Edinburgh on the way and culminating, we think, uh, at the state funeral a week on Monday. And I watched with great interest and actually not a moment not a small amount of joy at how ian blackford in the house of commons and nicola sturgeon took great pride in the fact that queen elizabeth regarded scotland as a home from home and that balmoral was her favorite home of all of them and of course there she is after an incredibly long reign and a distinguished life that she should pass in Aberdeenshire itself. I think really for the past number of years and the Queen indicated this herself you may remember last October when she opened the Scottish Parliament that she spoke after the passing of Prince Philip about her deep affection, the family's deep affection, one for Scotland as a whole, but two in particular for that Balmoral estate in Deeside that's been in the royal family really since, what, 1852, I think, when Prince Albert purchased the property for the Queen's great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria. And really? ever since then, it's... Uh, it's been a place of security, of peace, of privacy for the Queen and her family. You've seen all those terrific pictures over the years of picnics and barbecues, great stories of the Queen driving around the estate in Land Rovers, uh, really having guests there. It's just been a place for privacy. The people in Balmoral and Balata, uh, the two small areas near there they're very fond of the queen they treat her as a local and she was very fond of them too she had a great freedom to drive around and to sort of I don't know, go down the shops or anything but she was seen a lot around the estate and the security protocols were less in place is that a fair comment john yeah, look, it's 50 miles away from Aberdeen to the west. Uh, mm -hmm. um, it's a 50,000-acre-plus uh, estate. It's got streams, it's got hills, it's got plenty of places to walk. You talk to locals and to tourists who tell you stories of encountering the Queen and others just out well, out for a day's walk, as yeah. well as, of course, she would go to local fets, uh, very well known for going nearly every year to the, the Braemar Games, which are very famous there. Um, so, yes, Do very they toss much. cabers and, there, John? Well, uh, at the Highland Games, they do indeed, yeah. But then your Sassanach's in Aberdeen. It's too well, far south, isn't it? Well, yeah, for me, certainly. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, very well known. And, of course, she would go and worship at the local Crathies Church. Yes. Um, so, so, really, a local to that part of the world, um, which is a side of the Queen that, obviously, we all know. Um, in recent years, obviously, apart from the pandemic, she, she sometimes spent up to 100 days a year in Scotland. Um, the whole of August, the whole of September, usually at Balmoral. And we'll talk about her relationship with Balmoral through the summer and the early autumn in just a moment, John. Stay with us, because now we're going to hear this lovely tribute from the former Prime Minister, Theresa May, um, and it's this lovely cheese anecdote. Take it away, Theresa May. 
I remember one picnic at Balmoral which was taking place in one of the bosses on the estate, and she just smiled. <laughs> and the cheese remained on the table. <laughs> She's funny, isn't she, Teresa? She should have been a bit more funny at the dispatch box. Anyway, there she is on the back bench uh, telling wonderful stories. And I think uh, John Boothman, who's with us, political correspondent for the Sunday Times, boy, oh boy, Liz Truss, I mean, there is a baptism of fire. Um, not as experienced at that highest level as, say, Boris Johnson and Theresa May. How do you feel uh, Liz Truss has done in these literally first week of the job she's not even been in in the job for what four days well let's start off by just finishing off that bit about Balmoral what yeah, go on. Balmoral basically an old prime minister goes and a new one comes and then sadly a couple of days later the queen passes away but let's trust I mean you know I think so far um, I'm interested in that she's a no fuss and no drama, Prime Minister. Um, I think maybe for a while there that people were starting to get slightly concerned. They were waking up in the morning to see what Boris had done next. <laughs> and we are now in a position where uh, we are in very, very serious times. Uh, the announcement about energy and the cost of living overshadowed, of course, by the sad passing of the Queen. But, you know, uh, maybe the country's ready for something a wee bit different from what we've had before. You say that she has a lack of experience. She's been around for a good long time. She's been in the cabinet for a good long time. So I think she knows the drill. Uh, I think she knows the challenges and we need to see how that unfolds over the coming period. You're right. I mean, she has had one of the four big offices of state before the premiership. She was foreign secretary, of course, and quite an effective one. Uh, we kind of know what she stands for. And of course, she's been uh, on the front benches for about a decade. Now, Balmoral, as you say, was where the Queen loved to reside through August and September, but it was the scene of probably the greatest drama of the Queen's time uh, as our monarch, when she stayed there for just that little bit too long after the terrible events of Paris in 1997, late August, last day of August, when Princess Diana was killed and she stayed at Balmoral and the nation was calling for her and eventually she fronted it up. Not only did she come to London from Balmoral and break from her period of time there, her holiday, if you like, in, in Abendinche's uh, countryside, but also she fronted it up with crowds at Buckingham Palace as well. So Balmoral was at the centre of probably her greatest drama. I think these were very, very difficult and challenging times for the Queen and for the entire royal family. Um, it's interesting, I think, the lessons that perhaps they learn, certainly in terms of how to engage with the public. I can recall, for example, uh, Tony Blair and Alistair Campbell being around at that particular time, in fact, really giving or trying to give advice to the royal family about how they should deal with that situation. But, you know, looking back now in all of these years that the Queen has been uh, the monarch of this country, I looked the other night, um, the Queen uh, reigned for 25,775 days. <laughs> Who would ever have guessed that someone could be on the throne so long? Uh, she she uh, was in power uh, during a time where there were, I think, seven popes, 13 US presidents, 14, 15 prime ministers, and somebody said on Twitter the other night, and 61 Italian governments. <laughs> so really, uh, the Queen, uh, a great constant presence uh, in our lives, and yes, that was a difficult time, but the royal family and the Queen moved on from there. I love that. And the bonus ball, 61. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if Italian politics oh, is a bit more stable these days. And six James Bonds. Oh, yeah, that's right. And that's that's a big shout as well. And she was always uh, the figurehead for, for James Bond on Her Majesty's Secret Service. And of course, that bit of fiction will become His Majesty's. Secret Service now, as we contemplate all the lyric changes and changes to our pound coins and notage and post boxes. Um, God save the king. God save the uh, king. We, 
QCs are, are now cases. That's right. Uh, There's another. The, the, the army, all sorts of nomenclature is going to have to change and all of this transition happening right before our eyes and very, very quickly. Send him victorious, happy and glorious, long to reign all over as God save the king. Um, it's, uh, I still called him Prince Charles this morning. I'm getting that out of my head. I'm doing my very best. Um, John, I just want to ask you some question about what the Queen represented. The Queen represented the post-war settlement, um, the peace between our European warring nations, Britain and Germany, and Germany and its allies across Europe and the world. Japan and Germany are now Western allies of ours and have been for decades and decades. We've seen the tragedy, though, of Russia invading Ukraine. We have seen China looking covetously at Taiwan. We've seen them more or less take over Hong Kong. We've seen Iran get closer to developing nuclear weaponry. And so the post-war settlement, as we understand it, may be coming to an end. We're seeing an emboldened China in the United Nations. And with the, with the Queen passing, is this a moment in our history where, for better or worse, a chapter is turning? People have talked about the end of the Second Elizabethan Age. I was also struck the other day when reading about the Queen that when the Queen uh, well, when she became queen, that Stalin was still in charge in wow. Russia. Wow, yes. And all of these changes, you're right, you've talked about, have happened. The world has moved on, things have evolved, and yet we had that amazing phenomenon, the queen being constant throughout. And I think one of the interesting things, again, and the, the, the proof in the pudding will be in the eating, is how the new king... Uh, who we are transitioning to now can evolve with the times also. Um, the, 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 I, I was also recounting that, you know, the great, we know the, the King's Speech, the great film that we've seen with the radio and people sitting around the radio uh, during the war listening. You know, the Queen transitioned uh, uh, after the coronation. The coronation itself was the biggest live television event that there ever was more people brought televisions. So all of that moved on. We are now in a social media age. As I say, the proof will be in the pudding to see how King Charles III, as we need to remember to call him, um, really becomes in charge now. John, you'll be able to answer this question. Do you still call him by a different number in Scotland? Because I think Charles II was... Charles the Sixth of Scotland, have I got that right? So is he Charles the Seventh? I think technically yes. I think James the Sixth of Scotland uh, became James the First of England. Uh, we know, of course, there was a controversy about the late Queen that uh, we never had a Queen Elizabeth the First, of oh. course, in Scotland. Uh, so when she was Queen Elizabeth the Second. Uh, some people in Scotland. In fact, uh, again on television last night, um, they defaced pillar boxes in Scotland to lose the two Q2R, to oh, lose the two the in the middle. first in Scotland. So, so um, I think uh, I can recall the opening of the Scottish Parliament in 1999, where the Queen was styled at that time in Scotland, Queen of Scots, and mm. she seemed to be quite happy with that. Mm, that is very, very interesting. What I'm struck by, though, is that the Scottish nationalists seem to be very conciliatory about Queen Elizabeth. And I've heard it before that even if they did get their dream of complete devolution, of independence, that the king would be head of state? Is that possible? That's where the, the Scottish National Party's policy is. I have to say in the past few days... I think out of respect, even for those people who are Republicans in Scotland, that actually the, the, their criticism of the monarchy has really been muted. So, uh, yes, there is a strand of opinion. I think there's a strand of opinion across the UK about the future of the monarchy. But certainly, should ever Scotland become independent, uh, then I think the head of state would remain the monarchy. 
which would be extraordinary because you'd wonder whether much would change. I know that Scottish nationalists would feel uh, that, uh, that that would be very different. But John, it's been such an interesting conversation. John Boothman, thank you for joining us this morning. John Boothman is political correspondent for the Sunday Times based north of the border, obviously. 0344 499 1000. Just so interesting to hear a slightly different perspective from around uh, our nation. And I mean England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. If you're listening, watching in Wales and Northern Ireland via Talk Sport, you're welcome to our Talk TV output. We are paying tribute to the life of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. If you have a recollection of visiting uh, the Queen to your local area, you have some memory, please share it with us on 0344 499 1000. Or if you don't want to come on the telly or radio, you can, of course, tweet or text the story to us. Tweet at Talk TV, tweet at Johnny Gould, text 87222 and start your text with talk. And now, Let's see this terrific piece of oratory from our former Prime Minister in the House of Commons when they sat directly after the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II from Boris Johnson. A few months ago, the BBC came to see me to talk about Her Majesty the Queen.